Welcome back to a door cream prints videos with a difference. Before we go any further, you may have noticed something very different about the studio. Um, about two weeks ago, I decided to clean up this absolute cesspit of an office of my partner's, and all the um, dead files and junk and everything else you saw in the last videos is now gone, and everything's been tidied as you can see. And I've managed to bring in a little print shrine, as you can see. A few recent books and guitars, overflow and spill. Now, expect that in the next videos to build up over time. Now, um, today's video, very important one. I've been putting this off for such a long time for other reasons. Um, things have got slightly better since my last video, but um, basically I've had a pretty bad cold for the past two or three weeks, and um, it's been pretty horrible. Basically, that Francis Fran, I don't know what it is, I just got very sick. I'm still quite sick now, so I apologise if my voice isn't the finest. Um, we're going to talk about, we're going back to classics, you know, we're no more fooling around, no more um, gems or anything else for a while. And this is a video I've been putting on for a while, and there's a good reason why. Um, basically, in my last um, classics video, a while ago, we were talking about Purple Rain and that success. And now we're going to go across into this album, Around the World in a Day. And as you know, this is definitely one album that's had very little coverage here by the Sprints channels. I bought this beautiful record set six years ago, secondhand in Australia. I just love it. It's magnificent. Of course, you even got this as well. I don't know what part of the album that came on, though, but very nice. Now, what we're going to talk about, though, is there was a period between late 84 and early 85, between the two albums, where, basically, as you know, with Purple Rain, Prince had become the biggest, basically, star in the world. Had hit after hit, you know, he'd had the successful movie, he was doing the Purple Rain tour, he had all the protégés that had hits like, you know, Sheila E and Vanity Six, and not so much Vanity Six, I guess. But, um, and um, basically Prince, by the end of 1984, was the biggest star in the world, but as he found out, fame was fickle, you know. Americans were very fickle at the time, and, you know, publicity meant everything. You had to have a good publicity agent. I mean, even Michael Jackson at this time, this is before, you know, all the scandals broke out, and he was carving his face up and everything else. And sadly, there were three or four little things that happened to Prince between late 84 and early 85. None of them were major, but they were all enough for people to basically turn off him in droves. I mean, they did a lot of collateral damage to his career, that, so that by the end of 85, I mean, people were almost over Prince. It's not to say he completely disappeared from sight, like, say, someone like Vanilla Ice or Lady Gaga did, but he definitely saw his fame drop back to sort of more normal levels by the end of 85. And um, there were four or five little things... Um, it's hard to, first of all, this is just an opinion, I mean, first of all, I've never been famous, so I don't know what it's like to handle fame, especially sudden fame and adulation, so I'm not criticising Prince for some of these things he did, but, and second of all, I mean, I was very young at the time, I was eight going on nine years old, I wasn't into Prince, I mean, I knew of Prince, I knew the song Little, you know, Little Red Corvette and When Doves Cry and stuff, I wasn't a fan of his. I had no interest, I mean, I wasn't even old enough to watch the news or anything, so I wasn't watching like, I mean, Prince, you know, upset British people when he walked in there with his four-foot-high pompadour and said, don't look at me, I'm a star, you know, I mean, I don't remember any of that stuff, you know, I only found out about this stuff when I became a Prince fan in the 90s. So, let's launch in. Now, the first thing it was, okay, let's just quickly look at where Prince was, say, in November 84. Basically, by that stage, he'd had the three number one hits, you know, um, well, sorry, two number one hits in the number two. He was having his next top ten hit. I mean, um, Sheila E was having hits. Um, the Time were having hits. Purple Rain had basically come on and become one of the, the best rock and roll movie of all time had been acclaimed at. I mean, he was on top of the world. He had just started the Purple Rain tour. And the album had sold something like nine million copies. You know, everything was just coming up roses for the guy. But then things started to go wrong. And I'm going to talk about three or four little things. The first thing I want to talk about basically is the Purple Rain tour. Now, first of all, Prince's tours were always known for the fact they were raw, there was lots of funky, there was lots of solos. Now, with the Purple Rain tour, things fell off the wheel a bit. I mean, from the first shows in, Saint, I mean, in Detroit, they were massive, massive hit shows. But the thing was, people were already complaining that they weren't that good. I mean, there was a lot of noodling, there was a lot of, there was a big sequence where Prince was playing the piano and talking to God that was putting people off. There was also, you know, extended Sheila E drum solos. I mean, we all love Sheila E, but, you know, casual fans only want to come and hear stuff like, you know, when doves cry in Purple Rain, don't want to hear Sheila E bang away on the bongo drums for 10 minutes while Prince is running around the stage wearing his grandma's clothes going, isn't she talented? Isn't she talented? Yo, real musicians playing real music. And also, I don't think two people were talking about Prince's attitude, like you had to sit through the time, and you had to sit through other groups like Sheila E and everything else. This was even in the 1999 tour. It wasn't as cohesive. Even in the 1999 tour, there was some more self-indulgent soloing. 
it got to a point in um, Purple Rain. And even though every concert was selling because, you know, Prince was the hottest act of 1984, everyone wanted to go see him. The fact remained was people were getting a bit tired of the self-indulgence. And if you actually look at the latest shows in March and April of 85, the sh places aren't selling out anymore. They're almost selling out, but not quite, because people are getting a bit tired of it. I mean, too many bad reviews, and you know, like, oh, yeah, we liked it when you played, um, you know, in Doves Club, but you only played half of it. And then you spent 10 minutes talking to God, playing the piano, and sure you can go, get me all of us! Are you there? Were you the first one to drop the apple? And I think it was just a bit too cryptic for people. So that's the first thing, the Purple Rain Tour, Diminishing Returns, and of course the other Diminishing Returns was, you know, Take Me With You, the fifth single. It was overkill. You had all this music coming out, people were just getting a bit tired. I mean, people were just being introduced to Prince's prolific behaviour. Because it was, even though Prince was a prolific artist, in the kind of way Prince only became mainstream of 1999, and I think generally with most big artists, you've got the one to two year, maybe even three year gap between albums and there was that big gap between 1999 and Purple Rain, you know, because that was the time when all the singles came and became hits. So people were expecting there not to be a follow-up to Purple Rain, at least until the beginning of 1986. And as you know, I mean, Prince had already written Around the World in the Day, and he was working on Parade by the time it came out. In fact, Prince was actually playing the songs I Wonder You and New Precision while he was still doing the last two Purple Rain shows at the Orange Bowl in April 1985. So there you are, too much product and self-indulgence. Second thing was that, well, it was the mid-80s, this was the age of the music video, this was the age of the, you know, people wearing clothes and imitating them, this was the age of instant stars. Now, as you know, in 83, it had all been Michael Jackson and Thriller and Beat It and all that. In 84, it was Prince, and already at the very end of 84, there were two new people. No one knew, but they, one was, but one wasn't, that were also having big hits. Of course, the one I'm thinking of the most definitely is Madonna. I mean, Madonna just came out of nowhere and just had a massive number one hit with Like a Virgin and her album, Like a Virgin Soul. Then there was Material Girl. And so all of a sudden, all these young women wanted to dress up like Madonna with their boy toy stuff. And she just took off, basically. And unlike Prince, Madonna was much more photogenic. She was much more friendly to the cameras. She loved the publicity. She knew how to handle people. And then, of course, you got Bruce Springsteen, who had a massive hit with Born in the USA. That album was mega platinum. I mean, it was competing with Purple Rain. And of course, unlike Prince or Madonna... Bruce Springsteen was very down to earth, very working class. His music was earthy. It reached across to a lot of people. Not so much black people, but white people just went in droves for it. And then, of course, you even had other big stars in 84, like Lionel Richie. I mean, he was massive with his Can't Slow Down album. And he was definitely aimed more at the more sort of adult audience, like, you know, not teenagers and eight-year-olds, but more like, you know, 30-year-olds. So, I mean, 84 was just a year of big stars. So, I mean, if you wanted to remain on top, you had to keep my main, maintaining the momentum. I mean, Michael did with the We Are The World thing. But realistically, Michael's popularity dropped off a bit until Bad came out in 87. So, I mean, this was the 80s. And also, I mean, friends were changing. I mean, Prince's look would become dated very quickly. And then, so that's another thing, too. I mean, there was all this competition, basically. You know, you've got to keep constantly releasing stuff, and it has to keep crossing over. Now, the third thing I want to talk about is just bad publicity. Now, bad publicity is a big one because this really affected Prince in the early 80s. First of all, we've got to talk about this obsession with bodyguards. Prince had had these bodyguards since, you know, 1981. I mean, got big check here. Now, this is from one of my favourite books from the 80s. Again, it's not in good condition. But this is in 1985. February 85, he won an International Performers Award in Britain. I don't know what it was, you know, but he came over. He didn't talk to the people. He didn't perform any songs. He got out of the car. He had this phalanx of bodyguards would be a way to describe. You see there, look at um, the look on Prince's face. It's like they said, He's got like the foot long pompadour. Look how angry the people are around him. I mean, people did not like this type of pop of you know pomposity. You know, people think that when you become a star, you need to give back. You don't need to act like you're the king of the bloody world. And that's what Prince was. I mean, look at the look on his face. It's like, don't look at me, I'm a star. You know, I mean that that pompadour. I mean, it, it just made whole, people were saying stuff like, I want to string that little black faggot from the nearest tree and that type of thing. That's why they honestly felt about him. You know. And basically, you've got this five foot two dude, you know, walking around in high heels. He's got this hairdo up to here, and he's like, don't look at me. And I mean, the sad thing about it, though, was Prince could not seem to handle the public. He didn't know how to deal with the public. He wasn't he wasn't charismatic unless he was on stage with a guitar or anything. I mean, like, if you look at him at the Academy Awards, I can't, I mean, one of the awards, he wins an Oscar or an Emmy or some fucking thing. I don't, I don't know this shit, you know, okay. He walks up on stage, and um, he's like, Everyone's doing these long ass acceptance speeches, and Prince is like, Thank you. Thank you to God and my management. Here, hold this. And he gives it to Wendy, and apparently Wendy took the thing home and she kept it that night. And Wendy said, We looked like gargoyles in that picture. And it's in the video part, the part where Prince was wearing like this 
like Vantilla type, Berkwa type thing, like this purple spangled thing. I mean, no wonder people are always calling him gay, you know. But anyway, he, he was just weird. I mean, people thought he was on some shit or something. But it wasn't really anything serious. I mean, Prince was just really, really shy. I mean, he knew what he made was good, but he, he just couldn't deal with it. You know, just this instant fame, this instant adulation. He didn't realize that when you become a big, big, massive star, something you've been fighting for for a long time, you have to basically be out there for the public. You have to be giving yourself to the people. And Prince didn't know how to do it. I mean, secretly, Prince was extremely grateful. I mean, to him, I mean, having something that cross over and be such a massive hit was pleasing him. And then the other big part of really bad publicity, this still ties into free, but number four was this damn thing. As you know, late 84, there was this um, famine in Ethiopia, and um, Bob Geldof got into, got into a willy over it. Went out and did the song, you know, Do They Know It's Christmas, and they got all these British pop stars. I mean, there was a meeting of all the makeup mullets and asphyxiated hair spray. And um, they went in there and recorded the song, Do They Know It's Christmas Time. Wonderful song. Then the Americans decided they were going to do something, and they got Michael Jackson and Lionel Richie to go remake the song, We Are the World. And this song, as you know, sold gazillions. I mean, this is a second-hand copy I bought. I mean, I played it every now and then. It's a great song, actually. I mean, you know, it's actually a really well-written song. Anyway, it was written by Lionel Richie and Michael Jackson, and they got all these stars, and, you know, but I know it's on this list. You've got people like Ray Charles, Lindsay Buckingham, you know, from um, basically um, Blackwood Mac, Smokey Robinson, a lot of black stars, but quite a few white ones, too. Cindy Lauper, Huey Lewis, and the new Kenny Loggins, you know, and like I said, every single Jackson brother's mentioned here along with Latoya, Kenny Rogers, Diana Ross, Paul Simon, so Bruce, even Bruce Springsteen, Tina Turner, all these people, you know, produced by Quincy Jones. And of course, they wanted Prince to come and sing the song. And then Prince wanted to, um, you know, they, and Michael wanted Prince to sing next to him. And Michael even picked out some lines for Prince to sing. Prince said, no, you know, you've heard the song, hello. He said, no, I'd rather write a song instead. You know, and then what happened is um, basically Prince got a lot of bad feedback. It was like, oh, Prince doesn't want to do the song because he doesn't care about starving Africans. Oh, Prince is so selfish. He's so up his own ass. And then even worse, what happened was on the night they went in and taped the song, apparently Prince was at a, some restaurant called Carlos and Charlie's, obviously some 80s designer restaurant. He was in the car with some woman, you know, and apparently um, he rather went there. And apparently what happened was... um. He jumped in his limo, some photographer jumped in there and basically one of Prince's bodyguards punched him in the head and he said, no, no, just smile up yours, no, you're a star, star. They call them bodyguards, but they call them my friends. Of course, this is before Prince had written hello, so we didn't know Prince's side of the story. So yeah, and of course people said, oh, Prince has got a group of goons around, oh, Prince has got all these thugs and gorillas around him, and they focused on um, Big Chick, because let's face it, the guy really did look like four motorcycle gangsters welded together in one unique white trash package and i say that because what chick did next is deserving of the title and of course prince got all this bad publicity you know again like i showed that picture of all those sneering people around prince and his bodyguards i mean it was just bad bad publicity because all the people were hearing about was oh we're raising all this money for these starving africans who are going to grow up and kill each other anyway and uh, oh this prince he's so mean oh he's an asshole how dare we're not going to buy his copies of purple rain because he's a he's a horrible selfish man the fact that Prince actually did put a song on the album for the tears in your eyes, which, I don't know, you must have heard the song, it's on the hits. I mean, it's phenomenal. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. I mean, how many other songs did Michael Jackson write for the album? None. But, you know, oh, you know, Michael Jackson's like the big hero, you know. So, it's hypocritical. I mean, I'm acting this way because I do feel people were being extremely harsh towards Prince. I mean, this was a man who'd just become this big star, and he's expected to be everything for everyone. So this was more bad publicity. And then to make matters worth, move to section four, and that's gossip. Basically, as you know, America's full of trashy gossip magazines like the National Enquirer and, you know, Weird, Weird Weekly News. Even stuff like People and Parade Magazine and Esquire, they've got rubbish sections, you know. And basically, um, there was a story, basically, Chuck Huntsbury, you know, the big guard, Early 1985, he left the Prince camp because he wanted more money off Prince. Prince wouldn't give him to him. And he made up this stupid story that Prince was high on cocaine all the time. He was a hermit who lived inside a house. He was scared of germs like Howard Hughes. And that he had an altar to Marilyn Monroe in his bathroom. And all this other crap. And it was complete rubbish. You know, I mean, he made... There was a funny interview at the time where, you know, he said that the National Enquirer wrote this rubbish, basically. And then um, he believed it. People... He thought it was funny originally saying, you know, this is the type of the papers that have the pictures, you know, saying, my, I was fucked by an alien and here's my baby to prove it and it shows some baby that's been painted green with like antennas on its head, you know, you know, E.T. E. is my lover, you know, and um, 
principal was funny, but then you realize it was damaging, and there's a song called Old Friends for Sale, you know, you know, for cocaine, is that where your money goes, you know, that type of thing. Talk about stuff, talk about stuff you don't even know. That was the original version of Old Friends for Sale, of course, I'll talk about that when we talk about some of the outtakes of the Around the World in the Day era. And um, so that also did the rounds, I mean, as you know, I mean, this is a couple of years before Michael Jackson and all the crap that starts spewing about him. And it was just at a time when people were starting to get interested in Diana. But basically, you know, a lot of people bought the stuff and believed, you know, that Prince was this bizarre weirdo. And then, of course, it was all the other gossip. Like, another story was apparently he put a voodoo hex on Michael Jackson and he was into voodoo. And this leads to Section 5, which was basically reaction to his music. And again, in the same era, apparently some woman called Tipagor, we all know about her, basically um, bought her child, eight-year-old daughter a copy of Purple Rain. She was listening to the song Darling Nikki, as you know, the only song on the album that could possibly be seen as the old prince, included such unforgettable lines as, I met her in a hotel lobby masturbating with a magazine. Tipagor heard it, she had kittens, and she probably decided that, you know, there was too much rude rock and roll, so Prince got labelled with all these heavy metal artists, you know, who apparently had satanic back masking in their music, and Prince was seen as a pervert and a satanist because the only god he must be worshipping, obviously, is the one in his pants because all the songs about sex. So just all the shit just blew up at once, and Prince was basically put on a list with acts like, you know, Judas Priest, Megadeth, um, Twisted Sister, and they were seen as a diabolical music, and you know those parental advisory labels, you know, you can thank Prince for that, basically. So more bad publicity. Not only was he an asocial pervert, he was also a man who basically preached Satanism, sexual um, depravity, he was also had no skills with people, he showed no gratitude, and also he didn't care about starving Africans. So... All this shit's building up, baby. We've got all this shit, like, trying to squeeze through the door. This is all equaling bad, bad publicity. And then finally, number six we've got to talk about is the ego complex. I'd already talked about how Prince's ego was increasing during the controversy in 1999 to us. He was the big star. People worked for him. They did as he was told. Now, with, before now, that was crossing over to the fans. Prince was not giving out masses of interviews. He was not doing public appearances. He was not doing encores or after shows like he did later in his career. So people thought the guy was just stuck up, basically. In reality, Prince was absolutely painfully shy. You know, he felt like he had nothing more to prove. And then seven, unrealistic expectations. I think a lot of people, and this will, I'll deal with this more when I get to um, Around the World in the Day, they had these unrealistic expectations that Prince had to basically produce music in the vein of Purple Rain Forever. People were disappointed when they put on Around the World in a Day and it did not sound like Purple Rain too. You know, it did not like, you know, and Prince himself said it many times that by the early 1985, he was absolutely sick of the whole music and concept. He was sick of playing When Doves Cry and Let's Go Crazy. He was just, he had just moved on mentally. I mean, like I said, he was already writing songs for um, Parade and um, stuff like that. And I mean, he just was getting tired of playing, you know, Let's Go Crazy and Little Record Weird and all these songs from 1983. And, you know, even... By the end of the Purple Rain tour, you might notice pictures of him, he's wearing his big bandana, because his Purple Rain perm here, he cut that off in about February or March of 85. He'd got sick of that whole sort of mid-80s, you know, sort of jerry curl perm. And, I mean, he'd already cut his hair into the sort of, you know, flatter parade shape. So he let it bush out a bit during mid-85, like, in the Raspberry Parade video, but it's nothing like. It's kind of blow-waved in the sort of Oprah Winfrey-type perm, you know, rather than anything else. I mean, it got nothing like it did until basically he started growing the afro back in the late 2010s. So that's part of the fallout. So basically by the time Around the World in the Day was released, I mean, Prince was not quite the public darling that he was, you know, several months earlier when Purple Rain came out. I mean, it's important to mention this too, because up to and including Purple Rain, every album had been like, you know, a constant upward trajectory with the public perception. But starting with Around the World in the Day, it started coming down the other way. And also, it's also a change period because up to and including Purple Rain, Prince's star was getting bigger and bigger in the States, but after Purple Rain, it dropped. But on the other hand, it started to increase outside of America. I mean, Prince, by the time of the parade era, was becoming the critics' darling in Europe. I mean, as Prince's music matured beyond basic meat and potatoes rock and roll music and into sort of more funky, dancey stuff. Well, he was doing that before, but I mean, it was really the sort of more rocky stuff like Purple Rain that was crossing over in the States. People were starting to realise that this was more an event guard artists rather than just someone who just writes pop hits for the masses basically it's like oh yeah prince he's had a number one hit you know so what and realistically with prince number one hit i mean that's just such a rare occasion so i mean in a lot of ways i mean that's what purple fallout was so the uh we are the world you have a lot to answer for basically yeah as you can see i mean a lot of michael jackson i mean looking like a bit of a 
a woofter to be honest with you. I've gone off Michael Jackson a bit, I think, actually. I'm honestly now starting to thinking maybe he could have done those things to those children, but who knows. Anyway, peace and be wild.